Welcome, or welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is Nick Walsh, and he's going to be talking to us about machine learning and all the different options that you have available to you on the AWS platform to help your company. Take it away, Nick. All right, cool. I think we are good to go. Thank you so much. Um, Wow, there are a lot of you here. That makes me excited. I'm so thrilled to be here to get to talk to you a lot about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and get down to brass tacks and talk about how you can start leveraging it for your organization. Um, a little bit about myself really quickly. Uh, my name is Nick Walsh. I'm a technical evangelist here at AWS. I have the unique privilege of getting to go out to, to conferences, write blog posts, and make content to make your lives easier as developers trying to leverage Amazon Web Services. In the past, I primarily worked in data science, AI, and machine learning. I've written software that analyzes everything from brains to sharks to skin to food. Um, and now I write code that helps you deploy infrastructure. Uh, so I'm excited about helping you all solve your problems. I've worked at some cool companies in the past, and I like doing live video content just like this on this Twitch channel. So if you like what you see here, we've got more of it. So sign up there. A quick roadmap for what we're going to get through today. I have a lot of content, and I know it's going to be tough to make sure everyone can understand everything with every step of the way, but you will be getting all of these slides after the talk. Here are the major points I want to hit today. First, Machine Learning 101. Machine learning is very difficult. There is a large knowledge uh, bump that you have to get over to start utilizing it. I'm going to break that down as simply as possible to try and get you on board to understand how this can work for your organization. Next, I want to talk about the AWS AI and ML offerings and tie in how the learnings you just uh, received about machine learning will drive the different options that you can leverage. And lastly, I want to really drive the point home, tie everything together, and talk about what are the tangible next steps you can take at your organization to start leveraging this new knowledge and start using machine learning to unlocking business value. So first, here's machine learning in 10 minutes to the best of my ability. First, what is machine learning? I have here a dry definition. I've tried to cut it down from the even drier examples that typically get thrown around. But at its core, machine learning is a process by which a computer system makes decisions, A, based on rules that it learned on its own, B. Those are two very critical pieces of information. Now, you've probably heard a lot of other terms in this space that are very similar, and you don't know where they fit in. And trust me, you are right to think so, because sometimes these terms are used interchangeably and for good reason. First here, we have machine learning. And so the key aspect of machine learning is the uh, software's ability to learn rules. Now, people typically joke about artificial intelligence and saying, if-then statements are examples of artificial intelligence. And the truth is, they're right. Because by definition, artificial intelligence is simply the ability for software to make decisions. And so the difference between artificial, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is that in artificial intelligence, any Software that makes a decision can fall into that category. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, whereby the software has uh, the ability to learn these rules on their own. So yes, if then is artificial intelligence, but machine learning uses classes of algorithms to figure out what those rules may be. So it makes it a subset of that. Even, even further, you may have heard of something called deep learning, where rather than just learning rules based on uh, parameters that we've passed into it, Deep learning enables uh, applications to learn uh, nebulous concepts that we as humans can, can, uh, can, can reason about, right? Uh, if we pass in a bunch of numbers, uh, we, we can actually ascertain what are physical representations of those numbers in, in an image space. Again, easy for humans, but that's what deep learning really unlocks. So we have a really large landscape here, uh, but today I really want to focus on machine learning. So first, what are the steps of machine learning? And again, depending on what, this, what your problem case is, there are more specifics, there may be more steps, but this is the crux of it. These are the core steps necessary for machine learning. First is your problem statement. Second, you have to undergo training of some form. And third, you have inference. Don't worry about that. I'm going to dive into each of them. First, to get started, you have to ask yourself a question. What are you trying to solve for? Are you trying to identify something? Are you trying to optimize for a certain parameter? If you do not ask yourself a question, you will not, your, your experiments will not bear fruit. You will, you will just be senselessly analyzing your data. And, and there, are, uh, way, there, are, there are reasons why you should explore data that you have to unlock other insights. But ultimately, in machine learning, you need to enter the conversation with a goal in mind. And you may not get the result you want right away, but 
you have to abide by an experimental process by which you are running an experiment, getting results, and improving. And that only starts with a question. There are three classes of learning problems that will help you, by understanding them, will help you dictate what question you are asking and thereby drive what algorithms you will leverage. These three are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Most of your problems will likely fall under the supervised learning space. These include tasks where you have data that are, that are labeled, and you, as a human, can look at them and ascertain certain patterns. Machine learning enables the automation of that process at the software level for almost any type of data. Examples of this being classification for images, or uh, being able to classify uh, the prediction of a certain uh, object based on other objects that are near it in the k-nearest neighbors classifier. Unsupervised learning is where you may approach a data set and you may know, I need to understand the behaviors of the data set, but I don't know the specific parameter I need to optimize around. Now, that is a form of a question, and you can access this through unsupervised algorithms. For example, if I have a data set, I don't know what I'm necessarily looking for, but I know that I want to see if there are patterns or clusters uh, in this data set. And so unsupervised learning enables us to, to learn that through uh, automated clustering, k-means, et cetera. This is really popular in the data exploration and data science space. And lastly, we have reinforcement learning. Uh, this is typically complex reward spaces, where it's uh, a series of actions that may lead to some ultimate sort of consequence. Think of it like an agent that would play a video game. Obviously, the goal is to complete the level, but you have a uh, reward function that uh, you want to feature uh, you want to reward positively for making more progress in the game or, or uh, getting more points in the game. So it's, not a, it's, a, it's a more long-term long sort of uh, solution. Examples of this are, are autonomous driving. So once you've defined your problem statement, you need to move on to training. Now, this is where it really gets scary for a, a lot of examples and tutorials that I have seen out in the wild. So I want you to break it down to this single equation that I have here. I'm going to make it, I will explain each part of this equation such that you will walk away knowing how to apply this to your company. So we have on the left hand side data. This is what your organization must start with. On the right hand side, you have a model. The model is the, the set of rules that your software will be able to then act upon uh, to leverage new data and per perform, perform predictions on it. In the middle part is the, the word you've probably heard. It's the dirty A word algorithm, right? This is what is most difficult to grok for most software developers or even organizations trying to think about how their data fits into an algorithm. So I'm going to walk you through an example use case of what machine learning looks like step by step and explain to you how this plays out in practice. So on the left, uh, we're going to talk about data first. So, on these graphs on the right-hand side, you can see they're all the same exact population. You have a data set with two classes. In this example, let's say that those are credit card purchases. And this is a data set of fraudulent and valid credit card purchases. But you can substitute that with anything else. Now, in this example, we've, we've truncated the data. We have transformed it. It fits in two axes, even if we have uh, many, many different uh, factors and features in our data set. Now, Red is indicating one class, so let's call that fraudulent purchases. And blue is going to be the second class. Let's call that valid purchases. So if we plot that in the graph, we can look at that. And if we look at all those graphs intuitively, we can sort of reason about how we would, as humans, try and draw a boundary on that set of axes to try and differentiate between the two and start to think about how we would consider that. But algorithms can do this in an automated fashion. And they have certain trade-offs that will be very beneficial. But I'll get back to that in a second. Next, we have the model. Now, it's typically very difficult to understand what a model is, because it is sometimes a noun, sometimes a verb. And so in this part of the process, for training, I want you to understand that a model is a noun. A model is an output by running your data through an algorithm. A model is essentially represented here on this graph by the purple line in each of the different graphs. This is the model decision boundary. This is very easy to understand in a binary classification example, because essentially what it means is that on one side of the boundary, it will, your model will be predicting all data points within there to be one class. And on the other side of the boundary, it will predict them to be the other class. So essentially, your model in this scenario is just a line. It may be a square like in the decision tree. It may be a, just a regular linear line like in the logistic regression example. Or it could be something uh, much more abstract like the SVM with the Gaussian kernel. It is, 
The model is the decision boundary by which new data points will determine what the inference is. So if I feed it a new um, data point, it will classify as either valid or as fraudulent. Now, what about the algorithm? Where is the algorithm represented here in these graphs? And the answer is that it is not, because the algorithm is not an object or a property of your data or the resulting model, but it is a process that will, that will generate the model. So it's not actually visible here. And this is why it's very difficult for people to understand really where algorithms play in here. Every algorithm behaves differently. And much like sorting algorithms that developers are also uh, aware and, and, and familiar with, uh, each has inherent trade-offs. And understanding those trade-offs is what will ultimately result in a higher accuracy model, more efficient training times, or scalability with respect to certain parts of your data. That does ultimately require a bit of re uh, in-depth research to understand. But that doesn't mean that you can't get off the ground with bas more basic models. So next, we have inference. This is where the magic happens. This step is where the value is driven to your business. You can train a model, and the output is a static blob. It's, it's an equation. You can't use anything with a, with a, with a CSV with a bunch of uh, numbers in it. What you need to do is you need to be able to perform inference on new data to leverage that rule set that we just created automatically using machine learning. And that is what enables you to tie in that predictive power into your applications. So in the second step, we are going to start with data, but not labeled data. You don't understand what this data has. This is your new data from the wild. Let's say a new purchase. You don't know if it's fraudulent or valid. You want to be able to predict on that. So your output is the prediction. You want to classify this certain object. And the model here, it was a noun before. It gets loaded in and can be used to take in data and perform that prediction. So going back to these graphs, again, uh, fraudulent and valid credit card transactions. So first, what does the model essentially represent here? So I mentioned before the decision boundary in purple. But to understand what this really looks like, I've colored in the decision areas for the two different classes here based on the results of those uh, machine learning algorithms. So in the SVM, everything in red in, on that side of the decision boundary, if I put in a new point piece of data and it, it maps to anywhere in that area, the model will predict that the purchase was of that class. So if we said red was fraudulent, it will predict fraudulent. Now it's important to realize that if you actually look very closely, uh, there is a red data point from our training set that is on the blue side of the, uh, the decision boundary. And this is very important. There's the concept of overfitting or underfitting, where certain parts of your, if you overtrain your model to your specific data set, it will do a really good job of predicting the data you've given it, but it may not behave well in the, out in the wild. This is something you'll learn over time, but again, is not something that I think should hinder you from being able to get started with, these, with, these, uh, with understanding these machine learning models. So in just about 12 minutes, I have gone through machine learning, all of the things that are involved in it, and the different steps. So I've talked about them all independently, but I'm going to take an extra minute here to uh, nail down exactly how this process works from beginning to end. So you start with the problem. You consider some sort of optimization parameter or some sort of question you are asking by which you need to experiment and get an answer for. This parameter, this question determines what type of algorithm you're going to feed it into. Do I want to know what other uh, pieces of data are similar to it? Do I want to be able to identify something based on the class I'm assigning it? Do I want to be able to perform uh, predictive analytics in time series data? This question will drive what algorithm you are using. Traditionally, you already have data. And, and if you don't, a question can drive what data you acquire in order to be build your model. So as a part of training, Data feeds into an algorithm, results in a model. Then once your model is, is created, uh, you wrap that model as a function by which you can then feed new data into it, just like any sort of microservice or an API that you already leverage, and you can gather predictions. So 12 minutes, end-to-end -end machine learning, though that's, the core, that's the core basis of it. So hope that was not too dense, but uh, I think it's a necessary primer for talking about how all the services fit in. So how does this play into AWS? So our mission at AWS is to empower developers to be able to use machine learning. And we understand that developers out in the wild are not all research scientists and PhDs. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to leverage the power of machine learning. And so we firmly believe in customer choice. 
And what this means is that we build uh, options to be able to allow you to leverage this technology regardless of your skill set and all the way across the stack. And there are certain optimizations uh, that will enable you to do this extremely efficiently, where everyone doesn't need to use the exact same uh, tooling depending on your use case. So to accomplish this, to build all these options, AWS has built the cloud with the broadest and deepest set of ML capabilities. But you don't have to take my word for it. You can just ask our customers. Uh, more machine learning happens on AWS than anywhere else. There are over 10,000 customers of AWS ML services, two times the customer references of any other public cloud, and over 85% of TensorFlow projects in the cloud are run on AWS, TensorFlow being one of the most popular frameworks for building, training, and deploying machine learning models. So what is the technology involved in order for you to start leveraging this power? So at Amazon, we, we figured, OK, well, th this, is, this is really transformative. We need to build out a new stack. We need, regardless of what uh, entry point a developer or an organization has, they need to be able to set, we need to predict a set of assumptions, and they can get their output, which in every case is going to be some sort of prediction. So what does this look like? At the top of the stack, we have AI services. Typically, I do this in reverse, and I start with the foundational services, and I work my way up. But the honest truth is that most organization, organizations trying to leverage machine learning will not have uh, data scientists or, or highly technical uh, machine learning researchers that can leverage or efficiently leverage those foundational technologies. Nor is that always necessary. The magic of the AWS AI services is that these are a set of handcrafted, purpose-built machine learning models that will enable you to take them off the shelf and ingest them like any other API pass in your data, and get the prediction. You don't have to worry about providing data to train. You don't have to worry about any infrastructure. You can sign up today and pay per call to receive the business value of these highly curated, highly accurate models. And we have them for more and more services every single day. I'm going to go through them really quickly. And I think that some of these business use cases may resonate with some of you. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about customers that are using them out in the wild. So we believe it's really important that AI should work for your business, and the AI services really live up to that. You, you can leverage it without needing to get started with uh, training or any of these other operations. So first, we have moderni modernizing your contact center. Very common use case that we see, improve customer experience. Uh, there are lots of services we have to do this in the cognitive space. Poly is able to take text and make it audio, so you can automate uh, voice messages to your customers. Transcribe will take audio data and, and transcribe it into text so that you can run analytics on it or, or just have any sort of uh, foundation for, for a uh, tiered messaging system or a follow-up system. Translate is, is fairly intuitive. Comprehend extracts the, the uh, sentiment from your text. Are the customers happy, sad, neutral? And Lex, which is a fully integrated chatbot system that enables you to essentially make your own call center or make your own chat center for support, all from one AWS service. Customers love this. Uh, Liberty Mutual Insurance is a great example. They use Amazon Lex and AI services to develop NLP and conversational apps to improve their customer experience. And uh, this improves response time, quality of service, and it's a win-win situation all around. Next up. Using AI services to strengthen the safety and security of uh, your application. So accurate facial analysis, identity protection, and metadata extraction are all valid examples. Implementing and rolling your own two-factor authentication can be scary sometimes, especially if you want to use images. Thankfully, you don't have to worry that the machine learning may not work as intended. If you use services like recognition for image, video, or comprehend, even in the medical space, we have highly curated, highly accurate models that will be able to perform when you need them without having to worry about writing that, writing that machine learning code. This is used out in the wild today for real-time identity verification. IAA Accredit uses recognition to analyze images to verify an individual identity uh, with no human intervention required. So this is a huge jump, right? Processes that were typically required manual human interaction that could take upwards of hours can now take seconds and have them done in an automated fashion. This, this, this leap is monumental, and it's unlocking lots of value for customers today. Automating media workflows, again, another very common use case. Reducing costs, monetize existing content, streamline the ops around that. Don't have people um, standing there doing tasks that you can now automate. So for example, recognition for understanding images instead of having to have people look at them and automate the annotation of them. Recognition allows you to detect labels in images. Comprehend again for sentiment. Uh, one of my favorites is Textract. 
Textract uh, is, a, is a wrapped purpose-built service for OCR, optical character recognition. No more do you need to manually write down the content that is on forms. You can actually scan that and run it through Textract, and Textract will intelligently extract all of the metadata from that form, and it won't just do it in a way that's a jumbled pile of text. Textract is built to actually return proper JSON and structured data from the forms that you have. We can do this for tabular data. If you print out a spreadsheet and then scan it, Textract can actually natively return that as, a, as an object. It, it's really powerful, and it's doing some amazing things. So C-SPAN uses this. C-SPAN runs uh, extremely long hours uh, of video content, and so processing that video content is, is very laborious. But with recognition video, um, they're able to cut down their indexing time by being able to annotate what's it images and, and create timestamps in an automated fashion. Um, so over 90, 97,000 images in under two hours. Extremely efficient and makes something ultimately go from the impossible to possible. Next, reducing localization costs, improving accuracy. Anyone who knows accessibility for content, blog content, documentation, knows how much of a, of a task this is to ensure that uh, your content is uh, evergreen for multiple, for multiple different regions. So services like Poly, Transcribe, Translate, and Comprehend all work to be able to uh, sort of build once and uh, leverage multiple times by using AI rather than having to scale out your team to be able to build this multiple times. Lionbridge uses this to scale real-time translation, uh, as well as being able to uh, translate into multiple languages. Again, something that requires extremely specific knowledge to be able to have translators, as well as the ability to um, a, a high cost of labor to be able to employ those people uh, and have them there when you need the translation done. Next, we have understanding the voice of your customer. I've gone through uh, this already in a lot of the different examples prior, especially with Comprehend. VidMob uses recognition and transcribe for metadata extractions and sentiment analysis. This is very popular with reviews. You can automate the analytics around how customers are feeling about certain products, not just using a starring system, but you can actually get nuanced information about the words they're speaking about you. This is really valuable if you're trying to leverage analysis of data on platforms you don't have control over, but you can still scrape the data for it, for example. Next, personalizing customer experiences. So, th so this is a big one, and it's really hard to do traditionally. Um, everybody wants to be able to have a process that is tailored towards their expectations, towards theirs, their experience, or prior actions they've taken. I think the worst thing in the world is when you call up, like, let's say, uh, your credit card company, and you were just on the phone for you know, 20 minutes going through a, a chain, and you, you get transferred, and you have to go through the same chain all over again. Well, personalized and some of these services um, help to resolve that. So Personalize is a service that enables you to uh, perform recommendation engine out of the box as a service over an API. This is the exact same technology uh, in recommendation engines that powers Netflix or whatever your favorite uh, video platform is that recommends videos. Um, or similar in Amazon, where you have purchase recommendations. Personalize enables you to perform these recommendations over an API with no machine learning knowledge necessary. Domino's uses this to deliver personal experiences around their messaging, their notifications for customers, and they receive uh, raving reviews from their customers over how this has improved uh, prior to what their prior example was. Forecasting, a traditionally very mathematically heavy topic, uh, difficult even for most people using AI and machine learning, uh, but with the release of Amazon Forecast, this enables you to be able to put in prior data, for example, your sales, and again, with no machine learning knowledge, be able to forecast over a certain period of time what the predicted sales will be. Sales are not the only thing. Let's take, for example, logistics or inventory. When you have inventory that sits, especially if it's something that's perishable, that results in lost revenue. Better predictions, better analytics results in dollars and cents in your pocket at the end of the day. And forecast enables you to do this by just taking the data you already have and plugging it into an API. And lastly, I, I went over this already with Textract. A lot of these services do cross over into multiple domains, which is, which is a testament to how, how truly powerful they are. But I mentioned before, here are some of the really powerful use cases for Textract. Um, OCR, optical character recognition, uh, traditionally very difficult. Text analysis, automated data extraction. Again, tasks that seem to be impossible to automate prior are now accessible over an API. The, the world is changing at such a rapid pace. So that was all the high-level services. Those are all of the functionalities you can access today when you go home, log into the AWS S3 console, or the AWS console, and start to plug your data into certain endpoints. You don't need to know anything about training. That's all accessible already. However, 
if you want to take it a step further, let's say one of those models did not solve the business use case for you, or you have a large corpus of data you've amassed that you think can help to tailor a more uh, personal model to your use case that can achieve higher accuracy, or maybe it's just a problem that none of those models address, this is where SageMaker comes in. SageMaker is the end-to-end -end platform for being able to empower developers to perform machine learning without needing to worry about the operations code that are involved with it, or the heavy-duty machine learning code under the hood with regards to array transformations and the, the typical mathematics that make it very scary. SageMaker makes all of that very easy. And in addition to helping you go from zero to one, from your data to a deployed model, there are a lot of quality of life improvements along the way that have been released as features that, uh, are, that are extremely significant for improving your workflow. Ground Truth enables you to automate data labeling, which is t traditionally an extremely laborious task. Um, Hosted notebooks enable you to spin up environments to start experimenting instantly without having to worry about your environment. We have optimized algorithms and a marketplace of algorithms that already exist out there or that you can actually start to pay to use in addition to the existing AWS ones. We have many more features, and I'll talk about them uh, in a bit. But when it comes to custom machine learning for your business, there's a few things to recognize because the value it can provide if you can fit your data into this paradigm or, or transform your company uh, to, to fit this pathway are immense. So the first is reduced costs. So if you can make the jump from an AI service to, um, to SageMaker, you can leverage ground truth and save up to 70% on data labeling. Again, data labeling is uh, an example of this is you have images. And let's say you want to classify what brand of sneaker it is. You need to have humans sitting there and defining for each of those images what that brand is. And then only after you have amassed that data set and conglomerated the results from your multiple people can you actually start feeding that into an algorithm. And that takes an immense amount of time. So by using Ground Truth, you can automate the distribution of this task, and you can automatically reconglomerate it. The best part is Ground Truth actually recently released a feature where after that labeling is done, you can actually, with one button, train a multiple image class, a multi-image classifier on that. So that exact same example I gave you, even with SageMaker, which I said is not an API-level service, it, it, it's, it's a no-code example in this case. You can actually take images, feed them into Ground Truth, distribute them over emails in the GUI to your workforce or to uh, an Amazon managed workforce, and automatically create and deploy a machine learning model off of that. Extremely powerful. Um, elastic inference. So anyone who's worked out there with uh, software knows how hard it is to do capacity planning. In the traditional software world, this is immense. You don't want to be over-provisioned where you have resources that are sitting there not providing value to you. But then you also don't want your website to go down or your application when you're under-provisioned and traffic goes through the roof. Machine learning is the same way. You need to provide predictions, and you want those, uh, the capacity to match the demand. So we've leveraged at Amazon all of the learnings we've had uh, around auto-scaling for some of our more foundational services and baked that directly into SageMaker. And this could not be any easier. You can check one box in the AWS console and enable elastic inference, which enables auto-scaling for your instances. You do not need to do any more work to make sure that you have the right amount of uh, resources provisioned. You will not be over-provisioned. You will not be under-provisioned. It's, it's truly magical. Um, we have, through SageMaker, lots of other improvements that we can access by building this end-to-end -end stack. So for example, there are a lot of different machine learning frameworks that exist out there. You've probably heard of uh, TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, and Keras, so on and so forth. There's the Gluon. There's a lot of them. But by building SageMaker as a purpose-built end-to-end solution, we've been able to closely t tailor how, they work, how those algorithms work under the hood to our infrastructure and, able t uh, and enable uh, more performant, higher efficiency uh, performance. So, so one traditional example that's really painful uh, with machine learning algorithms is that they are not developed necessarily to be able to run equivalently or optimally on every single platform. That's just a difficult part of software in general, especially machine learning. Now, at AWS, TensorFlow is an open source library. We have gone and applied uh, those same bindings so that if you use TensorFlow already, you can use it on AWS through SageMaker. And instead of being capped at what is traditionally a 65% utilization due to inefficiencies in how TensorFlow's overhead is managed, you can actually access up to 90%. So a lot of customers ask, why would I use SageMaker if I already know how to use TensorFlow? I can just put it on a server, an EC2 instance uh, for AWS. Well, if you use SageMaker, we can, you can leverage those optimizations we've made under the hood. Uh, and that is a fairly large jump in efficiency, which again translates to dollars and cents. So I'm going to quickly go through all of those benefits and features that I mentioned that improve the quality of life 
for your developers. And when I say quality of life, I don't just mean they're going to be happier. They're going to be more efficient, and they're going to be able to iterate more quickly, go to market with your new, uh, or launch your features so you can go to market with AI-powered features, uh, and be able to iterate more quickly going forward on your model. So first is collecting and preparing training data. I spoke about this before with ground truth. Um, but also you can have these notebooks that can serve as uh, hosted hubs or like masters, if you think of a master-slave configuration. This notebook, you spin up with one click in the SageMaker console. It enables you to go and reach out to other services. So for example, if you want to do pre-processing on your data because you have a ton of it and it needs to be cleaned, reach out to EMR over that notebook. Say you want to train. That's one line of code in SageMaker for fit after you've set up the job, and it will actually provision the servers that will do that training give you the logging and the feedback while that's happening in real time, and then spin them down after. And then ultimately, if you want to deploy, oh, you can do that from the notebook too. It's just one line of code. So it, it, it truly serves as a central hub, as a central hub that you can spin up really quickly and, and use existing code examples to see what an end-to-end -end pipeline really looks like. Next, you can choose and personalize your algorithm. SageMaker has a a lot of popular algorithms that are commonly used, and they're all uh, essentially normalized to have the uh, expected and easy to understand behaviors uh, and bindings. So you import the SageMaker client just like you would any package in your favorite language like Python. And with SageMaker, you can load in these estimators or you can load in these algorithms and run them. Um, you don't have to worry about learning an entirely different syntax for each one of these languages. All you need to know is if you go to the AWS docs for SageMaker, you look at the form the data needs to be in for this algorithm, the, the, there will be consistent and normalized behavior and usage patterns across all of these. Instead of, uh, if you're not using SageMaker, you need to leverage each of these packages independent uh, APIs or levels of ownership, which can get really tough. Next, setting up and managing environments. Again, we have one-click training. Once you've defined a job, you can do that with one click or one line of code in a notebook, a server, what have you. Training and tuning the model. Trial and error. This is, this is really tough. This is actually where understanding your model, understanding the data science th behind it is where you're going to see improvements of your model over time. So I mentioned before that this is an experimental pathway. You ask a question, you experiment, you get a result. You analyze your results. Can this be improved? Can it not be? What do I need to do? Can I get more data? Do I need to clean it more? Do I have to normalize it? You ask questions, you improve your model. There's also this concept in machine learning called hyperparameters. Really scary word, I know. Really, all it means is that, I mentioned before, an algorithm is a function, right? It performs a transformation on your data that outputs a model. Now, what if I told you during this process that before you hit go, there are a bunch of knobs that you can turn that will affect slightly how that algorithm behaves. And each algorithm has their own set of knobs. Again, that goes into the pros and cons of each algorithm. Now, what this means is that every single time you run that training, that unique configuration of all those knobs will differ in output from another configuration, even with the same data and the same algorithm. So very quickly, you can see how this becomes a really large computational space that is difficult to manually search over. And, and manually searching, I don't necessarily mean sitting there running each permutation of that, um, but writing for loops to iterate across all of these experiments to find the one that results in the most accurate model. Typically, there, there were people trying to make libraries, but that's, again, difficult to standardize because of all of the different interfaces for different algorithms. In SageMaker, we have this built in under the hood. We have very easy ways of just providing arrays for the different ranges of hyperparameters you want to iterate over, and it will actually, in parallel, spin up all of those experiments and Intelligent be able to iterate across all of them and spit back the ones that are the most accurate. Again, something that requires in-depth knowledge, typically, and a lot of legwork to write out that operations code. Deployment is a nightmare for machine learning models. Uh, that's the honest truth, um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You inherit all of the traditional problems of software, pro uh, software deployments, but then you also have uh, the handoff of the model from the training phase into inference. You have unique memory constraints due to the size of your model. Uh, your APIs can break fairly consistently with updates uh, uh, of these models under the hood. And so we, we try to eliminate all of that with one-click deployments. Again, it's a product of being able to build the end-to-end -end platform with SageMaker with everything in mind. A lot of tools only focus on one part of the process, and that's OK, and they can make optimized experiences for that part. However, when it comes to plugging all these parts together, there are gaps, and SageMaker is what really addresses that. And last, you can scale and manage. I, I, I talked about this before. Auto-scaling, elastic inference, extremely valuable, saves you money, and it's not really something you want to optionally do. It's something you, it, it should be on your to-do list. So SageMaker is extremely valuable. I'm not going to go and describe every single feature, but I think 
that after AI services, this is the one you're all going to be looking to possibly move to, either right away if you have a unique business case, or if you graduate from AI services, if you have a more specific problem, you will be looking at this. So I want to quickly go over some examples of what this looks like out in the wild. So Celgene uses this to advance uh, pharmacological research. Drug discovery is a huge computational space. And so they leverage SageMaker to be able to build a model that, instead of taking two months to train, can be done in four hours. Extremely, uh, extremely large gains. Uh, fueling product innovation at Intuit, they use this to reduce their machine learning deployment time by 90% from six months to one week. Again, that, that, that nightmare that I talked about before with regards to deploying machine learning models, um, it, it's just really tough to manage and it ultimately results in a lot of uh, labor in order to get those things deployed. A lot of checks, a lot of manual patching. With SageMaker, you automate that, you can guarantee that it's, it's built, purpose built end to end and, and you see the, uh, the, the gains with respect to uh, time efficiency there. The NFL uses this for uh, automated analytics. Uh, view, uh, they, they analyze from multiple camera angles the field uh, for hours and hours of episode every week. And so obviously this is a huge computational load and they can now take this down from, um, from months to process this to weeks or days. Last example I'm gonna give here is uh, GE Healthcare. Uh, I think ultimately one of the most valuable things is SageMaker unlocking value for people and machine learning unlocking value for people uh, that may be highly skilled, right? We think of automation of, of, of uh, simple tasks as, as very valuable, but uh, human in loop examples uh, like healthcare here are extremely powerful. So GE uses SageMaker to build out, uh, models that assist doctors and medical professionals in looking through CAT scans and other medical images. And again, this doesn't replace doctors. This is used to be able to serve as, as a check or maybe find things to, to trip to, to uh, alert them that they may not have caught previously. And I think this is just uh, really amazing that we're able to power up all the way across the, the sort of like the task spectrum. So those two are the um, primary spots that I think many of you as, as, people, as people in organizations looking to adopt machine learning will live. Uh, but there's also the uh, bottom of the stack here. This is for expert machine learning practitioners. They work at the framework level. They may work on uh, custom or nightly builds of the frameworks for very specific reasons. Uh, and they want to build, train, tune, and deploy machine learning models, and they're probably doing it already at scale. So this is the foundation of innovation uh, for the AI stack. And so even if you're using the services above this, it's important to note that all the innovations that we do here at the bottom level of the stack are actually seen by these speed ups and improvements in SageMaker, in AI services. And you're gonna see that when I talk a little bit, uh, when I mention the diagram later about how to choose which service is best for you. We focus on performance, flexibility, and reducing costs, and we, we think this bubbles up directly through the higher level services that many of you will directly be working with. Okay, so we've gone through Machine Learning 101. We have gone through uh, the AWS offerings and how those apply to the knowledge we've learned, and now I wanna leave you with tangible steps so that you can move forward, tie this all together, and actually start asking the questions and implementing uh, the, 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 what's necessary to begin using AI and ML at your companies. So it's important to note, uh, in the last talk someone said like, what's the answer here? It depends. Machine learning is the same way, it's no different. I feel like almost every instance in software is, probably has the same answer. So in machine learning, there is no one size fits all solution. As I mentioned before, you can see for the same set of data, we could all reason about how we wanted to draw a decision boundary between those two points of data. Every algorithm will have a different interpretation of that data based on how that algorithm is designed. And as a, as a function of what your business use case is, what your constraints are, which I'll talk about in a moment, it is important to figure out all of those questions and then move forward. So, the ideal solution for your organization considers the intersection of these technical specs. First is latency. How quickly does your uh, application or your customer expect a response or your service from whatever is performing this machine learning prediction? Certain models will take longer to run, but may be more accurate. Again, this is a direct trade-off that you have to make as a company, and it's not always that you choose one or the other, there are ways to intelligently actually tier your models such that you can have some sort of uh, leveling system to where certain requests are routed. But it's something you have to ask yourself. Next is cost. Again, longer running tasks, longer running predictions, longer running training, which may result in higher accuracy, does cost more money. Is it worthwhile to train something for three weeks to get 95% accuracy if I can train it in one day and get 90%? There's no clear answer there. It depends on your organizational needs. Next is scalability. Um, depending on your choice of how you're deploying your model or uh, the, 
how, where you are choosing to deploy it. Obviously, a cloud service is one thing, but IoT devices, uh, running locally on other sorts of devices. Th there's lots of different things that you need to consider with respect to scaling it, uh, typically horizontally. And last is customizability. Uh, this model that you have, how quickly can you go, and or this model that you get, or the API service that you're looking at, how customizable is this to your use case? So there are, there are some knobs and parameters you can tune on the APIs such that it'll better account for what you're doing. But ultimately, you need to be realistic and think, OK, is, is, if my use case is different, I may need to look at a lower level service uh, and build out and start having a more mature data pipeline for machine learning. And that's only the technical specs. You need to really consider the cultural shift at your organization with respect to AI and ML, particularly, particularly with regards to data. So the first is uh, your employee skill set. So AI services leverage APIs. Your developers, that's their bread and butter. They're used to that. But if you start using uh, SageMaker, we try to keep that as, as, uh, as much in the traditional wheelhouse of developers with SDKs as possible. But they will need to do some reading on how to choose certain algorithms. But again, we keep this in mind, and we try to make it as easy as possible. But you will need to do some reading. Next is agility. How quickly are you going to be iterating on this model? Is it something where you're going to build it and then launch it once, and then you know that, that's kind of it? It's solved your problem, or it's an analytic tool? Or is it something you're constantly going to want to be improving? This will dictate what sort of training and deployment methods make sense. Next, you have foundational infrastructure. What is your company already doing with respect to your data pipeline? I mentioned at the start of my talk that you need to have a problem statement. And then you need data to train it. And then you need data to infer on it. Now, a lot of people still need to build out data pipelines for inference, and, and that's OK if you don't have live analytics or something already. But there are also a lot of companies that don't have robust uh, logging around the data that they already have. And so if you want to implement AI and machine learning, there's no getting around the fact that you will need to add structure uh, and add some sort of uh, pipeline to your data so that it can be accessible by your developers that are working on your AI and machine learning pipeline. They can't keep nudging your database admins to give them data sets. It's just not going to be efficient, and it's not how you build proper microservices in the long term. So for three steps here, first is create the loop, connect the technology initiative to a specific business problem. Again, uh, what, what are you trying to optimize for? What are you trying to solve? How can it provide value? If you can't, answer that, if you can't ask that question properly, you, your efforts will not bear fruit. Second, advance your data strategy. This is typically in data storage, but then the piping for how your data gets moved around your organization, extremely critical for machine learning, both on the training and the inference side. And lastly, organizing for success. You're, you can have buy-in from the top level, from your CTO, that you want to do AI and machine learning. But at the end of the day, you need to make sure your developers are empowered, your organization, uh, both through education, but also through access to all of the resources they'll need. Training can sometimes be expensive, but it also had, results in models that are extremely valuable. So you need to understand this and have this an organizational level understanding uh, from the top down for all of the players that will be involved. So. I know it sounds like SageMaker and the lower level services are put a lot of impetus on the company and the organization to be able to uh, take on this initiative. But I want to be very forthcoming that at Amazon, we are customer obsessed. We have a vested interest in you being successful, even if you don't have data scientists or high level researchers that are working in your organization. And so we have answers for you. We have the Machine Learning Solutions Lab, where we have uh, in-house data scientists and, and ML practitioners who can help with brainstorming. If you're interested, reach out to us. You don't need to have all the answers. If you're starting to question whether this is right for you and you want to get started, please let us help you uh, on that journey. We'll walk you through custom modeling or what may, what may make sense for you. Uh, training your model, what architecture will be efficient for your use case. And ultimately, you'll get to work side by side with us. We're not going to prescribe you things um, if, unless you want to. Um, we want to work with you so that you have a level of understanding and can achieve agency to grow and be independent going forward. Lastly, we have more formal education pathways through the machine learning training and certification. Uh, there's lots of uh, open courses that exist out there. But uh, the thing I really like about these courses is that they tie the theory back to the services and how you will leverage them, similar to how I've spoken about in my talk today. I haven't gotten the time to go into all the services and demonstrate to you them. Unfortunately, I wish I could. Uh, that's a talk for another time. But these courses are very efficient at that. And they're a great starting point if, if your organization is getting serious about machine learning. So. If there's one thing you take a picture of in this entire presentation, I hope it's this. So I just talked to you about a lot of different things. The slides will be online after two, but if there's something, take a picture of this. So this is a, a flow chart for talking through your problem 
and should give you a rough idea. It's not perfect. I'm sorry. Uh, but it's, it should give you a rough idea of where you're going to land here uh, with respect to what services you're going to leverage. So is your, common, is your problem common? Uh, and do you need a solution immediately? Well, AI services are ready. They're off the shelf. Just start hitting them with your data. You get answers immediately. If you don't have a common problem, do you have data? If you don't, you have to acquire data so that you can roll your, uh, roll your own model. That's just the reality of it. Uh, and do you have staff that are equipped to use machine learning algorithms? And again, I want to be clear. That doesn't mean that you have PhDs on payroll. What I'm saying is you, you can leverage it through a SageMaker's SDKs if you're willing to read docs and understand the trade-offs uh, that those models present, that we help to explain to you. And then once you have the staff that is comfortable using that, you have developed a mature data pipeline, you ultimately ask yourself, do you have specific infrastructure requirements? And almost all of you will probably not in the beginning. Um, maybe as you, you reach uh, extreme scale, or, or you are uh, trying to do multiple deployments. Uh, but even then, you won't even, SageMaker can help you out there. SageMaker has this awesome feature called Neo, where traditionally you need to train and, and deploy models built to every single way you would want to deploy it. So for example, if I wanted to deploy to a cloud server versus an IoT device, those are completely different platforms. I would have to optimize one for small size and one for large size, independent pipelines. Neo makes that all go away. If you can train your model once, again, with the power of it being an end-to-end -end platform, Neo actually enables you to deploy that model that you trained once to any number of platforms. And it, you access all of the efficiency that the researchers at Amazon have achieved with that. And then ultimately, if you start outgrowing uh, SageMaker uh, in, in, in its entirety and you really have extremely custom and specific requirements, all of those uh, benefits that are, that are accessed by those higher level services, you can dig deep and start using those with EC, uh, EC2 servers, EKS for Kubernetes, ECS for containers, frameworks, AMIs. It's available to you. We believe in choice. We want to meet you where you stand at your organization. And we believe that we offer the tools to be able to do that. So with that, that is my talk. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. I know machine learning is a hot topic. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Nick Walsh, and I'll be sticking around uh, if anyone has any questions. I think we may have questions from the moderator in the back in the meantime, though. No questions? All right. Uh, I, have, I have like two minutes. Does anyone have a question quickly? I can try and answer it here. So in the back. Question is? Uh, Sorry. Oh. Can, you, can you speak a bit more about the support network you have for companies to help advise um, our developers? And also, if you have time, speak a bit about the uh, data lakes or, or um, places we can put data that can be used by your platform. Yeah, so um, two questions. Again, first, what is the support that we offer and what are the tangible examples? Second, what does data maturity look like for a machine learning pipeline? What are the services at AWS that you will use? First, I mentioned the ML Solutions Lab. This is a more formal program um, that you can reach out, and, and we have dedicated subject matter experts, SMEs, to help with that, all those steps I mentioned prior. In addition to that, as a part of our enterprise support, we have Solutions Architects, SAs, where their job is to be assigned to you as an organization to, help, to know your architecture inside and out and be able to have all the context necessary to advise you on architectural needs, architectural uh, like systems design, and actually help you build some of that. Uh, so again, we have the formal program in the, in the solutions lab that's more of the machine learning and the data science side. But on the building side, we also have dedicated solutions architects that can help your organization with that through our enterprise support platform. Uh, next is what, does, what do the services look like for data lakes and other uh, data maturity pipelines? Uh, so the most common one here is going to be S3. Uh, simple storage solution. It is Amazon's uh, storage for, for any and all files. And so uh, you, you leverage that on top of uh, as, as storage in addition to databases that you may have. And in terms of pre-processing, which is something I didn't get into today, uh, you can also leverage Amazon services such as EMR, Elastic MapReduce, uh, to be able to distribute transformations on data before you plug them into your, uh, to your algorithm to be trained. So there's a variety of services on the analytics and storage side. Uh, I just gave a talk on how you figure out what machine learning is right for you. I run an entire show on Twitch about how to figure out what database is right for you. So uh, I wish I had time to talk about all of it. but. Um, a talk for another time, data lakes and, and uh, data maturity pipelines. So I have time, I think, for one last question. Does anybody have any, any brave comments or questions? He's, he's got a mic for you. Um, I, oh, I want to talk about OCR and yep. how ready um, 
it could be for our organization. So I'm, I'm thinking labels. Yeah, so I um, just gave a talk about this last week on Textract uh, for OCR. Going a little off script here, but let's see if I can get it up. Because I, th I think seeing the pictures and seeing what it can do uh, is, is, a, is a very strong testament. So again, Textract OCR, optical character recognition. Uh, this is a class of software problems in machine learning by which you, you feed, uh, the, this algorithm already knows what characters look like and you want to be able to run that algorithm on your given, um, on your given data to be able to extract the characters from an image. Very difficult, but Textract uh, is very powerful. I'm gonna show you this. This is a presentation I gave last week, actually. You can see that, right? Cool. So, you have a table, right? So you have some stuff printed out. So, traditionally, with OCR algorithms, you will just see all of this text. It, the, the algorithms all typically run left to right, and will jumble all of the characters that it detects all on top of each other. Now, you can write, write your own regex. You can write your own formatting. But again, extremely manual, extremely fragile, brittle. Textract automates this. So what you get is an output of running a, a, an image of this table. Again, this isn't hierarchical data, that, structured data we're plugging in. This is an image. Table is recognized. The words are grouped by cell. And you get structured JSON data as an output. Wonderful. Like this, 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 is, this is like truly magical. I know I'm like raving about it, but if anyone who has worked in OCR in the past knows how difficult this is, nonetheless, to build a generalizable service that will work out of the box for your use case. Everyone has tables. Everyone has uh, random forms, right? So let's look at that. Let's look at something that may not be as conventional a as a table. So here we have a, a bunch of different wild cards. You have parameters underneath instead of on the left. You have various types of, of marking, so an X. Uh, for, for no data, I presume, unless their middle name is actually X. Uh, you, you have all sorts of wild cards here, right? Like, I could think about if I knew my, this form in my organization and how I could maybe um, build regex to be able to format this out, out of OCR output if I got really good at it. But guess what? Textract does that out of the box. So, you know, if you have data that looks anything like this, uh, I think the results speak for themselves. Uh, but it, we'd be glad to talk more about your use case after over at the booth. Uh, and, and to talk about what this looks like for, for, for your data. So with that, I think I am at, at about time. So thank you all for the questions. Thank you all for coming out. I hope I taught you a little bit about machine learning. And uh, enjoy the rest of Collision Conference. Thank you.